Let's discuss now the security properties of the digital signature scheme. So uh, just to get remind ourselves of the terminology, let's assume that we have Alice, we have Bob. Alice is going to sign something uh, for Bob and Bob wants to make sure it actually came from Alice. So Alice has this public key and what Bob actually has to know is he has to know what Alice's public key is. So we're kind of sidestepping this question. Uh, it's also a very uh, pertinent question to Bitcoin that we'll circle back to, uh, which is how do you learn what Alice's public key actually is? Um, but we'll, and this is called PKI, that general field of, of binding people's real identities to their public keys, uh, public key infrastructure is PKI. But we'll assume that, that somehow Bob knows, okay, here's Alice and Alice has this particular value as her public key. Okay, so this is sort of prior knowledge, public knowledge. And you might say, well, what if Alice just puts her public key on her website? So that's fine, she can do that. Uh, but when you go and you download her website, how do you know that someone didn't change it, right? And then you say, well, it, maybe it comes down over a secure channel like SSL so that that protects uh, it from modification. But SSL has this problem itself too, right? How did, how did you know that you know, that that tunnel actually started with Alice's website. Well, it's because it had a key, a public key that was bound to that domain somehow. And, and so you end up in a big circle uh, where uh, the, the only kind of adequate, adequate way of solving this is really to introduce trusted parties that are going to go around and, and staple together these informations. But we'll, we'll come back to that later, okay? So somehow Bob knows Alice's public key um, and Alice privately knows her secret key. And not just a secret key, it's not like there's a public key and a secret key, like these are connected, right? There's that key gen algorithm that turns this secret key into that public key. So there's a mathematical connection between these two values. Um, but this is something that only Alice is know knows. Uh, then what Alice will do is she'll send a message, message in clear text. Uh, so, so signatures don't give you any confidentiality. If you want confidentiality, you have to compose it with something else like encryption. Um, but the basic algorithm, uh, the message is going to be visible. And then there's going to be this thing that's added to the end, uh, which is the actual signature on the message itself. And then what Bob can do is he can run uh, verify. So he'll take the message and the signature and Alice's public key. So these two components come from here and the public key comes from here. And uh, he can just make sure that that actually comes out to be true. Okay, so question mark, does this, does this actually end up being true? And if it is, then he can conclude that it was Alice that, the, the inference that you want is, it must be Alice that signed this message. Now, there's a few ways that inference might break down. In particular, let's say that Alice loses her secret key and someone's able to steal this value, then they could go around signing messages. So at the end of the day, all you really know is that somebody with this the secret key that corresponds to this public key signed this message. And we hope it's Alice, assuming that there's no other kind of security breach. Okay, so what do we want uh, from, from this uh, in terms of security? So the first thing is that if everyone knows Alice's public key, and in order to sign messages, all you need to know is the secret key, and there's a mathematical connection, right? There is some math formula that will compute this value of the secret key given the public key, right? The simplest one is just try every secret key until it comes out to this public key value. So there is some way to, to sort of uh, compute um, the secret key that corresponds to a public key. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that this algorithm, um, so call this an algorithm that would take as input someone's public key and produce the secret key. And so this is kind of an inversion of the key gen al algorithm. It's the key gen uh, run backwards. Okay, we wanna make sure that this, that uh, if this exists, elg is infeasible, meaning it takes at least two to the 112 operations 
uh, in order to, to, to complete this algorithm, okay? Um, and so I'm not going to go into the details of why we think that HeGen is non-invertible or that this algorithm uh, is actually secure, that you can't go around finding people's public keys and connecting them to their secret keys. Uh, but I will note that what it does uh, come down to, uh, so we think that this is, uh, we say it's, we believe it to be infeasible. based on the fact that if you were able to do this, there's also a different math problem that's exactly equivalent. Uh, so it's, um, it's called the discrete logarithm problem, uh, specifically on the particular elliptic curve that you're using. Um, so we believe uh, it's to be infeasible based on uh, a hard mathematical problem. And that does, doesn't sound like anything. It's just like, well, this algorithm is hard because it's a e equivalent to this other algorithm. And then this algorithm is hard. Well, what, what makes that other algorithm hard, right? It sounds like you're just sort of pushing uh, around hardness instead of actually saying this is, this is actually infeasible. Um, so what you're doing is, you know, DSA is kind of new, uh, but people have looked at discrete logarithms for a lot longer uh, than they've looked at um, DSA. And discrete logarithms also show up in other applications. And so what you're really doing is you're taking sort of a narrowly studied problem and you're proving that it's equivalent to a more broadly studied problem. And we don't know that the discrete logarithm problem is hard. Uh, it's conjectured to be hard. There hasn't been any progress, you know, in the last decades on finding very efficient algorithms uh, to do this. Um, and then the other thing I would note is that uh, if, I mentioned, I think, I believe I mentioned in a previous lecture, this idea of quantum computing. Uh, with quantum computing, there actually is an algorithm that makes this an easy problem. It's just that you require this, this different way of, of doing computing. So quantum computing will actually, you could walk around, take people's public keys and spit out their secret keys if you had a quantum computer that was big enough. We think that's 30, 40 years, years off. And Later, we'll, we'll talk about what that means for Bitcoin, right? It has this algorithm and let's say there are quantum computers. Um, what are we going to do? Does that mean that Bitcoin's done? Um, and so there's a sort of more sophisticated answer to that that we'll circle back to. Uh, but anyways, for now, we, we think it's infeasible uh, based on a hard math problem. Uh, the math problem is called the discrete log problem. or DLP. Uh, so this is infeasible for large instances of the problem and, and we're going to make sure that our instances are large enough. Uh, so it's infeasible on classical computers. Classical means not quantum. And infeasible means that if you take all the classical computers in the world and get them all working on one, solving one secret key based on one public key, and you run them for like the lifetime of the universe, you're not gonna, you're not gonna find the answer, okay? Or at least it would be very high probability that you're not gonna find the answer. Uh, so that's what we mean by infeasible. Okay, so now we have uh, it's safe to publish our public keys, and people can't figure out what our secret keys are. Uh, and then the second thing is that. Let's say that I don't know your secret key, okay? Uh, is there a way that I could actually forge a signature on a message? Um, so I'll, I'll say the security property is this. It's infeasible to forge sigma on message M if uh, the attacker does not know the secret key. Okay, so there might be a way that you could, um, for example, let's, let's go back and look at this verify function. So we have this uh, verify function. Um, so the message we know 
we know what Alice's public key is. We don't know her secret key, so we can't compute this value of signature. But another thing we could do is just exhaustively search on it, right? We could pick some random number for this and then ask, does verify equal true? And if it equals false, then we loop and we pick a new number. And then eventually we will find some value that's sitting there where this thing comes out to be true. Okay, so there's there's always an algorithm to break any kind of cryptographic, usually doing some sort of exhaustive search. Um, and note that in that algorithm, we never learned what the secret key was, right? We, we just kind of broke the signature for this one particular message. And note that also we could change the message. Like say we want Alice to sign something different. Uh, we put in the message that we want Alice to sign. Uh, we put in Alice's real public key, and then we just exhaustively search brute force this value until this verify function returns true. Uh, then we're done, we found a forged signature. So that's one way of creating forgeries, there's, there's others. And if you look at the details of the math that underlies how these signatures are made, there, there might be shortcuts. There's, there's ways of, of doing this that are a little simpler than just exhaustively searching on this particular value. But at the end of the day, none of these techniques are, are fast, okay? So in, they, they are actually infeasible. Um, the number of values, uh, the the number of values uh, for this that would create uh, this uh, that would have verify come out to be true is just huge. It's an enormous number. It's kind of like trying to find the exact right secret key that produces a particular public key. Okay, and so uh, this is also basically tied to the discrete log problem. So if you could break the discrete log problem, say you have a quantum computer or something like that, then not only could you compute secret keys from public keys, but you could go and lift signatures off other messages and apply them to new messages. Uh, another thing too is we, we get the adversary a lot of power when we say it's infeasible. So maybe they see lots and lots of signatures on messages or they see they have like a hundred messages. They're all like really, really close and they, they get to see what the signature is for all 100 of them. And then they just have to create one message that's sort of a variant on the other messages. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so you're not always starting from scratch. Sometimes you're modifying the existing signatures and messages that you've seen. And the argument of cryptographers is that it doesn't matter what you do, the adversary can do all of these things and none of it helps at the end of the day, it's still gonna be infeasible uh, for the adversary. Okay, so let's pause here. This is are the security properties, and then uh, I'll give you a, a few factoids, sort of trivia about signatures, uh, in particular ECDSA, uh, that that just might be of interest to you, uh, and then we'll move back to the blockchain data structure.